Okay, welcome back for chapter 9. Now Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive there, search out Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and bid him arise from among his brothers and bring him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not wait. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he came, behold, the captains of the army were sitting, and he said, I have a word for you, O captain. And Jehu said, For which one of us? And he said, For you, O captain. He arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. You shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male person, both bond and free, in Israel. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. The dog shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. Now Jehu came out to the servants of his master, and one said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know very well the man and his talk. They said, It is a lie. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus he said to me, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps, and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram, who, from what we learned yesterday, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now Joram, with all Israel, was defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Aram. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to be healed of the wounds which the Arameans had inflicted on him when he fought with Hazael, king of Aram. So Jehu said, If this is your mind, then let no one escape or leave the city to go tell it in Jezreel. Then Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram was lying there. Ahaziah, king of Judah, had come down to see Joram. So Jehu wanted to arrive in Jezreel to execute Joram before he got word of his anointing as king and have time to properly defend him or attack Jehu. Okay, verse 17. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came, and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take a horseman and send him to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So a horseman went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What have you to do with peace? Turn behind me or in modern day translation, mind your own business and follow me. <laughs> and the watchman reported, the messenger came to them, but he did not return. So meaning that the horsemen went out to meet the company, but did not come back. Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered, what have you to do with peace? Turn behind me. The watchman reported, he came even to them and he did not return. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. So the second messenger was told the same thing by Jehu, and he must have liked him too, because he did not go back to the watchtower. Apparently, Jehu was doing wheelies and donuts in his chariot, and the watchman reported that too. Uh, might be why the horseman decided to hang with him. Who knows? Verse 21. Then Joram said, get ready. And they made his chariot ready. Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And they went out to meet Jehu and found him in the property of Naboth, the Jezreelite. When Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. <laughs> so Joram reigned about and fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. So a reminder that Ahaziah and Joram were brothers and sons of Ahab and Jezebel. And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between his arms. And the arrow went through his heart and he sank in his chariot. Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his officer, Take him up and cast him into the property of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. 
For I remember when you and I were riding together after Ahab, his father, that the Lord laid this oracle against him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this property, says the Lord. Now then, take and cast him into the property, according to the word of the Lord. When Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him too in the chariot. So they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is at Iblim. But he fled to Megiddo and died there. Then his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his grave with his fathers in the city of David. Now in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah became king over Judah. And we need to pause here and ask, why in verse 29 does it talk about Ahaziah's reign? Well, first off, let's distinguish that Joram was king over Israel and Ahaziah king of Judah. But what's going on is the recognition of the accession of the Hebrew monarchy system. The Hebrews used an accession system for recognizing their kings. Under the accession year method, if a king died in the middle of a year, the period to the end of that year would be called the accession year of the new king, whose year one would begin at the new year. So here it's just noting that the time period when all this was going on was when Ahaziah was king of Judah. In other words, it was their way of keeping track of significant events. Verse 30, when Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out the window. As Jehu entered the gate, she said, is it well, Zimri, your master's murderer? So we need to remember that this is Jezebel we're dealing with here. By calling Jehu Zimri, she was sarcastically alluding to the previous purge of Zimri in 1 Kings chapter 16. Since Zimri died seven days after becoming king, Jezebel was implying that the same fate awaited Jehu. So then he, Jehu, lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And two or three officials looked down at him, and they gave him one of these. All right, verse 33. He said, throw her down. So they, so they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. So her officials had enough of her too. When he came in, again Jehu, he ate and drank, and he said, see now to this cursed woman and bury her for she is a king's daughter. They went to bury her, but they found nothing more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they returned and told him. And he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the property of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel will be as dung on the face of the field in the property of Jezreel. So they cannot say, This is Jezebel." And that's what happens when you're a wicked old Jezebel. <laughs> so, all right, uh, gotta, you know, you turn from the Lord and you hate him, uh, bad things happen. And that's the moral of the story. Thank you guys for being here. Hope to see you tomorrow. God bless your day.